Um, okay, good morning. Uh, is uh, my audio okay? Um, didn't have a chance to check it. Somebody give me a thumbs up if, if you can hear me okay. Uh, okay, great. Um, all right, so I, I'm, I'm not certain. I've got more things that maybe I can talk about. Uh, but uh, yeah, today I was mostly going to see if people had wanted to come for some questions. So uh, let me know if anybody wants me to start discussing anything about, um, you know, setting up your environment. Um, I mean, we could talk about the problem set. Um, although most people were fine on the problem set. Um, I'll just mention that I, um, I did actually post a solution. Uh, I didn't quite get everybody. I wanted to get everybody's done here before we started, but I still got two or three more people. So if I didn't quite get to yours yet, sorry about that. It should be done as soon as we get done with the session here. So uh, for the first problem set. Um, most people, uh, if, if you look at the example solution, I don't want to spend too much time on the problem set. If I took some points off for you, you know, you should look at the example solution. But um Probably the most was just uh, people not realizing, you know, using hexadecimal notation or like in some other places. So probably the most common problem was um, um, uh, not representing things correctly for negative numbers. So if, if you get a result of subtracting two from zero, you should get a negative two. So by our hypothetical machine, we're using what's known as a sign magnitude format. You know, if, if you closely read the textbook and and read my kind of hints here, so you know, negative two should have a one on the most significant bit to represent it's negative, and then two for the magnitudes. So that comes out, for example, is uh, eight thousand and two. So that was like the first example of a negative number. So um, anyway, so let me know if anybody has any questions on the problem set. Um. At this point, most people should have their development environment set up. I know some people had some issues with the development environment. Um, let me say some general things about those. So I know that, um, um, let me just bring this up here real quickly. Uh, so I'll remind you again, there's lots of good stuff. If you look at the additional resources um, that you might want to have to look at the links on there. Uh, but the other one was, um, if you look at this repository that I had uh, given you guys for, you know, setting up your dev container, uh, there, there's, there's two things on here. There, there are a couple of, uh, if you look at the issues here, there are some common issues. So most people, the probably the most common issue for the dev containers if you're still having problems with your dev containers is even if you've got your secure shell key set up correctly, uh, it, it, it can still fail when you try to push, you know, if, if you make a commit and try to push it, it might still say that you have permissions. So that, that could be either that you, you didn't get your secure shell key correctly set up, or I've noticed, I, I don't know, about half the time, I haven't been able to, to track this down, but about half the times in Windows, um, it, the, when you generate your secure shell key on your host machine, every time you start a container, it's supposed to inject that secure shell key into the container, but it doesn't seem to do that reliably on Windows for some reason. So I think, I think you know, this is most of the people that were saying they had problems with um, permission denied on public key is, is this issue here, the issue number two, I guess, on that repository about setting up your remote dev container. So uh, so you should check these workarounds. And unfortunately, this is a little bit kludgy, but the, the only, only workaround I know for this is uh, every time you start up your dev container for the first time, you can just generate, uh, sorry, somebody says we're having sound issues. So hopefully, I don't know if I can do anything about them if it's breaking up or something. I'll try and uh, I'll try and uh, maybe um, uh, turn up the sound a little bit here. Let me try my settings. Uh, yeah, it's as high as I can get it. I think so. Um, 
So anyway, um, back to this. If you are having this problem when you push and you're getting a secure shell key uh, uh, permission denied, you can't always just generate a key inside of the container. The, the drawback of that is every time you accept an assignment and start it in the container, um, you'll have to, uh, you know, before you can have to get started on the assignment, you have to do these steps. You have to go into the container and generate your key, and then you'll have to copy that key. So you have to get that key uh, and copy it um, and, and add it into GitHub, but then that should work. So, um, although one other thing while I'm thinking about this here for um, issues, um, but th there are other reasons why you might be getting um, a secure shell key uh, permission denied, even though you know uh, you might have generated your key. But uh, b before you start looking at things, um, it's always good to uh, oops, sorry, it's always good to um, um, make certain you don't skip this step here. So on your host machine, you know, before you actually get into VS Code, you know, you were supposed to generate your key. Um, so do the 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 gen key, um, and you're supposed to configure your username and email. Uh, but after you do those things, before you start up VS Code, make certain you you are your your the generate key does look like it's able to connect to GitHub, right? So you, so you should be able to do that step there, something like this, just uh, again from a terminal uh, from the from a uh, command prompt on your host machine do that ssh to um um to get at github.com it um and if your secure shell key is set up you should get a, a successful authentication um for whatever account that you set up your secure shell key for them. So you should try that first, but if that's working, but you are getting uh, issues when uh, inside of your dev container, when you try and push your commit, uh, then you can, you know, I'll point you to these on there, then you can look through these. So the most common one is the push failures, or um, some people can sometimes have problems trying to actually do the initial clone of the repository. So there's another issue about that with a, a way to work around uh, that issue there. So, um, but um, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say about that. I mean, I, I'm uh, for you for the for the students that are here with me um, right now. Um, um, I don't know if I can work with you one on one at this moment, but yeah, if you don't have your de development environment set up. Um, and weren't able to do the practice assignment, you need to get it done because you do need to get started on the assignment one. Assignment one is due tomorrow. Um, I already looked at the practice assignments and returned back kind of like a, a, a pass fail, uh, whether you had gotten it, uh, the assignment, practice assignment accepted and a commit made and pushed on there, so. Um, all right, so like I said, this might be a short session unless I get uh, some people to ask some questions. I, I was thinking um, at this point, unless somebody interrupts me, that um, I might talk a little bit about assignment one, uh, give a few more hints on that. So um, there's one or two things that, that maybe I wanted to mention or, or show about that. So let's go ahead and do that, I guess. Uh, so I, I think, you know, um, I think I'll go ahead and just, again, for practice, um, show you kind of starting from the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and try and accept this assignment. Um, um, as a uh, as a student and maybe kind of get, get started on it, maybe spend 10 or 15 minutes showing, uh, again, working on our first assignment here. So our first assignment, the, um, uh, the, the GitHub Classroom acceptance uh, link uh, should be, you know, if you go to your content and look under here, you should find the program assignment one, you should find the, the link uh, to accept the uh, uh, first actual assignment. So, um, 
Let me um let me go ahead and uh, accept assignment one as my um example student here. Um, oh, good question. So I did have maybe two or three people. Uh, let, let me show that. Uh, so, so if you can't see the chat, uh, two or three people had some problems um, where you're they were doing a commit, um, and basically instead of only the 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 lines being changed that they actually made code changes to every line in the file, and in fact for some people all files were showing every line being changed, um, and the 99% um, of the time, the issue with that is you've got the carriage return line feed settings incorrect uh, when you installed Git. Uh, this was mentioned um, um, in the, uh, you know, you probably have to pay careful attention, but uh, I believe it was talked about. It might not have been talked about here, but, but in the video when I showed installing Git, I mentioned it. So if you were installing Git, there, there was one thing that you really should have modified uh, when you run the Git ins installer, which was to uh, uh, not automatically convert carriage return line feed endings, um, but to actually just leave them as is. If, if you can, if you're on, this should be a problem only people that are running Windows will, will see. Uh, but if you convert them to Windows line feed uh, endings, carriage return line feed endings, the problem is, is that our dev containers are actually running Linux, so it, it causes things to fail uh, if it has the if it converts the line uh, endings for you. Uh, I'll come back to that as soon as I can get to that point here on assignment one. But um, um, so let me let me just get to that point here real quickly. So I'll just show you guys. Um, um, I'm just starting from the beginning for assignment one. I went ahead and accepted it. Um, kind of as a reminder that, I mean, um, you know, if you wait a bit, you should get a link to your repository or, you know, the other way to find that is if you go to your GitHub account, you should find that um, there's an organization that you're a member of for the, uh, the summer 2023 class. Um, and there, every assignment that you accept, you have a repository created for you. Uh, and you'll find the assignment one, for example, like I just created here. So, um, so at this point, I'm, I'm assuming that you've got everything set up. So every time you do the assignment, there should be like a checklist in here. So you have to basically do these four steps before you start uh, an actual assignment, assuming you've got Git set up and you've got VS Code installed um, and you've got dev containers working, that kind of stuff. So you have to accept the assignments where it did that. We have to do the, the clone repository step. Um, so let, let me go and do that. Let me, let me start my VS code. I'm going to close this folder. This is my assignment zero zero. I still have open from last time. Kind of as a hint here, even though when you close a folder, um, VS code will still have you opened up in your dev container, which um, I usually often like to also close that remote connection, which which disconnects you from your dev container. So now I'm actually running um, on my local machine instead of inside of a development container. Sorry, my voice is kind of already. Um, Yeah. 
Okay, um, that, I might be better now. Is, is, um, can you hear me okay now? I think it actually might not have been a connection problem, but okay, it's it probably my system. Sorry about that. Um, okay, um, so back to what I was saying. Sorry for the interruption. Um, I was about to do uh, step two, clone the repository again. So uh, remind you that, you know, make certain that you're cloning the SSH URL. So I'll copy that. Um, there we go. Yes, response bit better now. So we'll clone the repository. I'll just paste that uh, uh, SSH URL in there. Um, make certain that you are cloning your repository to your local machine. So again, if you're if you're running in your dev container, uh, it'll try and clone it into the file system inside the dev container. So I know that confuses people, but yeah, if you don't recognize that you're actually selecting a folder on your host machine, um, um, then um, you know you're you're probably running in a dev container still. So so here I'm, I'm actually selecting three on my host machine to clone my assignment one into. Um, and again, if your dev containers are all set up, um, it should give you an option to open the folder. And then once you open the folder, um, it should give you an option to reopen that in container. Uh, some people, you know, um, I'll say if you miss that, or if you, don't see, if you don't see that, you might not have your doctor working correctly. If you miss that, you can always try to do it by hand. So, you know, VS Code has lots of features and things. Uh, not, you can't do everything just from the, the menus and things. So uh, the, you might have to look at the command palette to get to everything. So in particular for the dev container, uh, if you didn't reopen your folder inside of a development container, you can you know open your command palette, search for dev container, and reopen it by hand. So, so then I'm going to reopen this um, inside the dev container. You need to be running in you know a dev container uh, in order to use the build system and all the tools and things for these class assignments. So. So the first time, you know, it does have to create the container, install some stuff. So it'll take a little bit of time here. Um, but once that's up, then you know, you know, make certain you, you do go through this checklist. Um, so once you've cloned your repository, um, you should be able to confirm that the project builds and runs. So um, oh, as a reminder, those keyboard shortcuts, like if I hit Control Shift C right here to do a clean, um, it probably it, it's not going to work uh, because those keyboard shortcuts are spe specific to the context of uh, being in a file. So for example, if I open up the um, the test for assignment one, now my keyboard shortcuts like the Control Shift C I showed you guys last time uh, should work to um, do a clean. Uh, control shift B. So this is the important one. Make certain that when you do a make all or do a, a control shift B to build everything that it looks like everything builds. You don't get any compilation errors or link errors. So. Um, and it's actually still building. So, you, so you, uh, you, you can't 
you know, it's not done until you get this message about the terminal is reused. So the last thing it should do is link together the, the test executable and the sim executable. So here is an example of a clean, um, a clean build there, everything uh, uh, built successfully, including both the, the test and the sim executables. Um, and, we, and again, we can run the tests. So if I do control shift T, it should run the unit tests or we could run the unit test from um, our testing framework. Um, so uh, oh, I don't have the, um, that should have been installed for you, but but yeah, if that's a missing, um, you have to look for the, um, um, oh, I've got it installed, so. Um, I have to check that. I don't want to spend some time with that, but yeah, you should be able to run your test extensions from there. Um, so you need to have the um, um, test mate, um, uh, uh, which supports the catch two uh, installed um, as an extension. So I'm not certain why I, I, my um, um, extension isn't working here. Uh, let me try disabling it and re-enabling it. Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, I, I have to come back to that. Sorry about that. So I'm not certain why. Um, so if your keyboard shortcuts aren't working, I had a question about those. Um, um, again, you know, um, they, they are kind of context sensitive. So make certain you try and do those from uh, when you have a, a, a file open in the editor. Uh, you can always check those. So if you go to your uh, the, the settings gear icon um, and look at your keyboard shortcuts, and then if you open up your JSON file, so once you have this up here, you can, there, there's like a GUI editor. You can actually edit these. Uh, you can try that out, but um, you know, I find it just as quick to just directly edit the JSON file. So if you select that, you'll get the JSON file. So you should have those, uh, whatever shortcut you want should be in that global keybindings.json file. So, so the ones that I'm using that I've been kind of showing you are the control shift C should be running the make clean, control shift B should be doing the, the default build action and T should be doing the default test action. So uh, yeah, if that's not working, I'm not too certain. We'd have to probably look at it one-on-one um, uh, -on -one specifically. So that should work. Um, for most people. Um, all right. Oh, okay. So uh, let me go back to the question about um, uh, the, the carriage return line feed endings. Um, so, you know, uh, oh, there, the, I, I didn't quite, there, there's one more uh, thing. Um, I didn't mention these before. I might have mentioned these in the, the video about uh, the practice assignment. Um, Uh, um, I, this isn't really a requirement, but um, um, I, I do have it set up so that for all the assignments, there are some issues, uh, although in order to, to do them, you have to actually go to the issues and create a new issue and then select the template uh, for it. Uh, but, it, but you know, these are meant to, to be there to help you. So if, if you've ever done stuff with GitHub, um, often the way that work is organized on GitHub is to um, um, use issues. So every time there's an issue for a new feature or a bug that needs to be uh, fixed, somebody will create an issue. And then uh, to fix the issue, what you do is, you know, you, you make a code, uh, some commits to, to fix the issue, to fix the bug or 
uh, implement the feature that's defined by an issue, uh, and then you associate the issue uh, with your uh, commits uh, when you're fixing. So, so once we've created an issue, um, um, what the 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 normal workflow is is you know you're supposed to like if I want to work on issue one I, I if I want to work on task one I create the issue for task one um, and I then I go ahead and um, for my feedback pull request that I'm working on task one um, I go ahead and associate the the task one so under development I can um, associate task one with this feedback pull request. Uh, when you do that, then it should show up there. And then once I've done that, then I can begin working on task one. So uh, again, you know, there sometimes there's extra information in here. So you might want to look the, at these. So for example, there's additional information about things you're required to do uh, to get the task to work. So um, yeah, so I, I just saw there's, there's a question about, you know, Docker, if, if you can't connect your dev container. Uh, a common issue is that you don't have Docker um, uh, installed correctly. So you might have to go back and reinstall Docker. Um, um, you, some people sometimes, especially on Windows, need to do some additional steps. So you need to make certain that Docker is installed and running. Um, and it, it really needs to use the WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. So um, um, yeah, uh, if you have some issues with that, if you don't have Docker running before you start VS Code, uh, you won't be able to, to get uh, into these, you know, run um, uh, your project inside the dev container. So. Um, okay, so anyway, that was actually the the the, the kind of the, the checklist before we get started. So so uh, if you got that far, you know I am kind of ready to do the implementation. So uh, re another reminder. So yeah, there's like seven tasks on this assignment. Make certain that every task gets at least one commit, right? So you should only modify code uh, that you're asked for for each task. Um, so the commit for task one should only have code that modifies or implements the initialized memory function and so on right um so like to get started on task one um so notice when we ran our tests i'm gonna have to run them kind of from the command line when we ran the test there's actually no test being run uh, for assignment uh, zero here because all of the uh the the unit test tasks are undefined initially with assignment so to get started what we want to do is we want to go ahead and define task one. So all that does is that enables. Uh, so don't don't change this if def. Just go ahead and you know change these from undef to define. Uh, and all that does then is it's going to enable these unit test cases here to uh, try and um, um, test whether you've implemented this function initialize memory correctly or not. Right. So you know um, you'll notice that initialize memory is not given. So if I do a control shift uh, B or if I do a make all, uh, we'll have an error because uh, here it's trying to call a function. You know, so here um, um, we're using uh, an object oriented design here. So we've got a class called a hypothetical machine simulator. Um, and we try to create an instance of the class. And then here in our test, we try and call an instance method, uh, but we don't actually have this implemented yet, right? Uh, so as I talked a little bit about last time on Monday, your first thing to do once you define your test for task one uh, is we want to put in a stub function and get back so that we can uh, be compiling uh, and running these tests, right? So um, um, and the, the basic things that we have to do to make a stub function, we first have to add in to the header file for our hypothetical machine. Um, uh, the signature of that function. Okay, so in the hypothetical machine simulator.hpp header file, there's the declaration of the hypothetical machine class, which has all the private member variables and it has the public methods, right? Um, so, in particular, uh,
Um, if, if we go back and look, so notice that that it's not returning any results. So we're not testing or or saving a result from initialized memory. So it doesn't. It's a void function. It doesn't return anything. It's a void member function. Uh, but it just takes two integers as input, right? So these end up being the the the, the start address and the end address, the, the base and bounds address for the memory that we're simulating for our hypothetical machine here, right? So um, our signature then looks something like um, um, a lot of this is described. So if you read the, the description for the assignments, it'll, it'll describe some of this in here um, um, if you don't know where to start. Uh, but you should be able to, you know, in, for example, inspect the, the signature of the method and be able to infer certain things to get started like I'm doing here, right? Um, so that that says that we've got a, a member method called initialized memory that takes two parameters as input um, and uh, doesn't return a result. Um, so from that, that actually should um, be enough, right? So, so the way that C++ works, uh, if you've never done a multi-file project is, you know, we're including that header file. So by adding in the, the signature, um, that should be enough, at least for the compiler to know, okay, well, this function looks correct in, in, in the sense that um, it has the correct signature. You know, it's, it's giving two parameters like I'm expecting, um, and it doesn't return anything, right? So uh, if, if you, uh, actually build um, after adding the signature, you'll get a little bit further, we should. Um, so it actually seems to compile the um, uh, the tests here, but then we get some link errors. You know, there's still an undefined reference to the initialized memory. So we're, we're trying to use this, uh, but we haven't, haven't actually put an implementation of that method anywhere yet, right? So, um, so back to, I just want to add in a stub function. So the actual implementations, so once we have a signature, we have to put the implementation uh, in the .cpp file. So all actual implementations go in the corresponding CPP file in the source subdirectories. Um, um, so something I should mention, uh, later on, I'm going to be requiring you to um, uh, create this function documentation. For this first assignment, um, I should have given these to you. So you'll find if you scroll down in here, there's some empty documentation, right? So there, there's actually a documentation for the initialized member memory memory function, uh, but there's no implementation there. And there's one for the others that you have to create. So for this assignment, you don't have to actually create your function documentation. You just have to write the implementation of the method, right? But make certain that, that the, the method where you implement it goes directly underneath the function documentation that corresponds to the method, right? So here, this is another way you could find out the signature. Our function, you know, to initialize memory, oops, copied the wrong thing there. So I want to copy the this because the signature that I defined here, the, the function prototype should be exactly the same um, as I show it uh, here, right? So it should be a void function. Uh, it should take two parameters, the, the, the memory base address and the memory bounds address. Um, and really, these names should match up here um, in, your, in your header file, although I don't think this will be a com compile error, but um, most people would, um, uh, would, would want these to to not change the, the names of your parameters and things between the declaration and the prototype and between where you actually implement it here. Um, and uh, the difference between a prototype in C, C or C++ and an actual function is instead of having the semicolon for the prototype, we actually have the, the curly braces to give the, um, the body of the function implementation. Um, and this is a void function, so so we don't have to do anything. Um, in fact, I really don't have to do anything at all. Um, I'll just leave it empty. Uh, and one other thing, though, um, this is a member function of the hypothetical machine class, right? So if you've never done, or if it's been a while uh, since you did some C++ classes, uh, the way you, you say that something is a member of a class is you have to put this little crufty 
stuff in front, the this, this syntax, right? So this hypothetical machine simulator colon colon indicates that this method is a member method of the hypothetical machine simulator class, right? So uh, here, you know, without that, this is just, just a regular C method instead of a member method, but, but I really want it to be a member method um, of my hypothetical machine class. Uh, I'll just copy paste. that there. All right. So anyway, that should be enough as of a stub function. So again, I encourage you, this, this is a discipline kind of known as incremental development, you know, so don't now at this point, you know, never do too much before making certain that your code is always keeping it in a compilable and runnable state, you know, so it should be able to compile and run the test. It might not be passing the tests, but it always needs to be in a compilable and runnable state. And anytime that you get to a state where your code is not compiling anymore, you need to stop and get it back into a state where it compiles before you do anything else, right? So at this point, if I did everything right, it should be, uh, that should be enough to actually allow it to compile and run. Uh, it probably won't work. It probably still won't be passing the test, but uh, it should be able to compile and run these tests, right? So let me go ahead and do a um, clean, build. So it is building now, right? So I can, I can tell there's no compile or link errors. Um, and it's kind of annoying. I don't have that. I'm going to, oh, there we go. So I don't know what happened, but uh, I got my test framework uh, enabled back again. So, um, so now I ran my tests here. Let's run it in the test framework um, um, so I can look at them. So I run them, but as expected, um, some of them are, in fact, they're all failing, right? So um, um, we've got these other member functions. And after we initialize memory, you have a base address 300 and a bounce address 999. We expect if we call the get accessor method for the base address, it should return 300, but we're just returning zero, right? That, that's what this stuff means here. So. Um, okay. So um, let me get back then. I'm, I'm finally, I, I can kind of answer the question about um, um, the, the character turn line feed endings. All right. So here's the thing to check about that. Uh, so if I wanted to make a commit now, and this is a perfectly valid place to make a commit. I mean, I haven't really implemented anything yet, but uh, I had made some progress. I've, I've got a stub function that uh, can actually compile. Um, and I can run my tests again for task one, right? So I could go ahead and make a commit of this, right? So notice this is where, um, you know, if you've never used Git before, this, this, this is very helpful to use the source control tab here. So this is showing me that currently I've got three files that are modified between um, the version that I have for the most recent commit um, and changes I've made locally so far, right? So for example, and, and you can actually click on these and get a side-by-side -side diff, which, which is helpful, right? So for example, my diff for the assignment one tests um, is, uh, you know, as I expected, this changed from undef to define. Uh, these got modified. I wasn't expecting that, but yeah, um, my formatter removed a space. That's okay. But but usually you should check these and be aware of these, right? So if you have your character turn line feed endings incorrect, two things will happen. For one, instead of just the files you made changes to, you'll, you'll probably see changes on other files that you didn't really change because the, the line feeds were changed everywhere and you don't want that. So if you're seeing that, you need to fix your character to line feed endings, right? Uh, the other thing is that, you know, if you look, in, if you look at the diff for a specific file, um, like I'm doing here, um, if every line is showing as modified, uh, that and, and you can't see what the difference is, most likely it's an invisible difference, which, which again is probably like you know, here I can tell there's a difference of a space that got removed, right? Uh, but but if, if the character to line feed was different, all these lines would show as modified, but but you wouldn't be able to really tell, but it, because it would be the, the character turn at the end that was different for all of these, right? So I should only see the things that I change, right? So the only thing I actually changed in this file was I changed undef to define. I didn't change anything else. Um, and the scroller on the right-hand side of VS Code can help with that. So I can see that the only places that are changes on this file are right there, 
right? Likewise, I should check everything. So before I actually stage these for a commit, you know, you want to check those. You only want to stage the things that you actually made, right? So you should be aware of what you're putting into your commits, right? So my header file, I expect only that line where I added the, um, the, um, the, the, the prototype for initialized memory. So that's the only modification I made there. So that's all we see there. Um, and then the implementation. Um, so yeah, I know so a space got removed um, in some places. But, but yeah, the uh, the besides that, the only the only change I made uh, was um, we deleted that meta comment, and we added in the uh, the stub um, implementation for our initialized memory. All right. So uh, anyway, I mean, you know, if you do detect that you're having problems with that, um, um, one. Uh, one hint about Git, you can always, you know, if, if I saw that my character return line feeds were messed up, what I would do at this point is I would close that folder and close that remote connection, and I would actually delete my local uh, copy of the um, of the repository and reclone it. Okay, so you can always, um, like for me, if I if I open up my file browser. I could always um, browse to my repos directory in my file browser, and I could just select that and delete that directory and then reclone it. Okay. So, you know, there, there's nothing, if you don't have anything that you want to save in your local copy of the repository, it's perfectly fine to delete and re pull down the stuff, whatever you had at last uh, that, that was in your repository. Right. And the other thing then, so I'll get back to, you know, the thing to check on that is, um, if you open up uh, a terminal prompt on your host machine, not in VS Code, but on your host machine, and do a git config a global list, you should see, um, so mine is set as input, but if you're on a Windows machine, uh, you want to have that set to, I think it's none, right? So, uh, so for a Windows machine, you'd want to do something like git config. I might have to Google this. I think it's none or um, um, uh, or false. Maybe it's false. Um, so uh, from this, if you read the description on this, this is the official documentation from Git. Um, 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 we want it for false, not not because we're only doing doing Windows only development, but we're doing stuff where we're cloning stuff. If you have a Windows machine, it's going to be cloned onto your local repository into a Windows file system, but you're actually running and doing the code development in the container, which is a Linux file system. So it's safest just to have it not do any. Uh, modifications of the character term line feed there, right? So just set that to false. So something like that. So if you do that now, um, uh, you should do that actually before you yeah, before you before you do your first clone, right? So if, if you have that set to uh, to to do something, so it will actually automatically change the line endings. The first time you do a clone, it will change all your line endings to Windows format, and then you'll be screwed up. Um, and you definitely don't want to push that back to your repository, or then you'll end up having Windows line feeds, and that will cause you problems. So, so any so the people that I that I talked about that, make certain you have that setting correct. So I, I should be safe now if I had that problem to reclone my repository. Um, all right. Uh, oh yeah, back to this, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll just go ahead and show. So, you know, since I, I, I looked at my commit, it's got what I have expected. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, again, if you've got stuff that you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to stage everything on the commit, 
right? I can just stage the files that I want to make my commit for. So I'll go ahead and stage those three files. Um, I, I, I uh, you know, again, this is this is more of just a discipline. As long as you practice giving me a title um, and then one or more lines of description, that's okay for this class. Although, you know, best practices are there's certain things about what should be make a good commit message, right? So um, anyway. Um, So, you know, my title, uh, need to have a blank line, and then my description for this commit. Uh, this commit compiling and running and test, but implementation is not, not complete. All right. So after that, um, again, once you do this, I mean, I finally made my commit, but it, it's still local, right? So now I don't have any diffs anymore because uh, my local commit um, has, I, I've just committed those changes I made. So that, that's my local commit, but I haven't gotten that to, to my repository yet. Um, and me, you know, for me to grade your stuff, I can't actually see any stuff that you have local, you know, not until you actually uh, push it. Um, to your repository, would I be able to see it and grade it? Right. We'll go ahead and push that and show an example of that. Uh, so again, when you do that, uh, you should be getting used to, you should be using the, the pull request a lot here. This is your most important thing to determine whether you've got things correct or not. So whenever I make a commit, I should see it, as soon as I push it, I should see it show up here on my feedback pull request. Um, and it should run the uh, the auto grader for me at this point. Uh, and you always want to check that you're getting what you expect here. So when I look at the auto grader results, um, I should see that um, it's running um, my task one test. So it's running stuff, but it, it's failing, right? So uh, it, it runs, but a lot of these uh, and and the the things that fail should exactly match when you run your unit tests locally in your VS code, right? So my first failing test is on line 46 because uh, it's expecting 300 for a base address um, and it's getting zero here, right? So I should see the, exactly that same thing. Um, um, if I look at my um, um, uh, failing test here, the, the first one in here is on the line 46, that one's failing, right? Um, all right. So anyway, I, I, I could, I, I mean, you know, I, I think I'm not, it's already getting close to 12. Um, uh, we'll see if there's some specific questions. Maybe I'll get just maybe one or two more things, right? So initialized memory um, is supposed to uh, open up. I, I normally just use the description right from here. Um, although, you know, by the way, uh, if you're curious, uh, the description is actually in the readme file. So if you want to, you can actually also open it up uh, inside of VS Code. Um, although this is this is a markdown file, so you'll see the, 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 the markup language for the markdown file. You can actually render these markdown files in uh, VS Code. Uh, so if you do like a right click on here and open the preview, um, that's another way I could have my my project description open up um, uh, in order to read the descriptions about what you need to do for the tasks and things. Um, um, so you do have to do some things like um, initialize memory, describe some things in, in here. Uh, but the basic one, I, I'll, just kinda, I'll just give these to you. I, I often do this for my classes for, for uh, 430. Um, so for our, uh, the most basic things that initialized memory is supposed to be doing is um, you know we've got a bunch of member variables in order to implement our hypothetical machine. This is the same hypothetical machine that you did for the problem set that, that you just submitted yesterday that I just returned to most all of you, right? So a couple of things need to be initialized by initialized memory. Um, uh, so the easiest ones, we have to initialize the base address, the bounds address, and the memory size, right? Um, so we can do that relatively simply. Uh, 
Um, oh, by the way, if, if you do use, I mean, you know, Gibbons is kind of a C++ C++ kind of uh, language crufty thing, but you know, here I gave the name of the parameter because I gave that in the documentation. I, I named it exactly the same as the uh, private member variable, uh, you know, memory base address and memory bound address. So that means that there's actually an ambiguity. Okay, so for a a function that's a member of a class like hypothetical machine, um, it can access private member variables, right? So I've got two things with the same name. I've got a parameter called memory base address, and I've got a member variable called memory base address, right? Uh, that can be a little bit of an issue. So some people, some people just give these a different name. So, um, you know, so you could do, and that's fine. If that makes more sense to you, I could call that like new memory. But if you do that, I would prefer you change it in the documentation. The documentation should always, um, uh, uh, be the same as the name of the parameter, or you'll get warnings when you generate your doc oxygen documentation here, right? You should also change it um, uh, when you for the function prototype in, in the class header. Um, or you know, the, the other common way to do this is in C, you can disambiguate. So uh, if you if you do this, which points to memory base address. C++ knows that you mean the uh, the member variable. This this member vari this instance is member variable called that. And if you don't disambiguate, uh, um, it will assume that you mean the parameter name, right? So this will cause the parameter that you pass in, whatever the value is, like three hundred, to be assigned to the member variable called memory base address, right? And we got the bounds address. Um, and then the size, we don't pass that in because the size of the memory that you're simulating is served from the base and the bounds address, right? So, um, so for example, if we look at our test, we see that, that if we go from 300 to 999, we expect to have a memory size of 700. That's because there's actually 700 uh, addressable locations from 300 to 999 inclusive. Since we start at zero, it's it's not that minus that. It's that minus that plus one. Basically, that's our memory size. Um, that that's and that's that's the the amount of memory we need. The, the number of integers that we need to allocate in order to simulate a memory that that has a base address of three hundred and a bounds address of nine ninety nine. All right. So anyway. Um, If you take the bounds address minus the base address plus one, you should get what we're expecting there for the memory size, right? So, so the, the higher end, 999 minus lower end, 300 plus one to account for that we're inclusive of the begin and the end address um, for this range here. So the way these work since we set the memory mem memory variables. Oh, um, by the way, um, another kind of Visual Studio Code kind of thing. I, I I like the outline, right? So instead of scrolling through or searching for stuff, uh, for example, if I'm interested in looking at the implementation of the get memory base address, I might open up my file explorer, um, and I've got the file explorer, but I've also got the outline here. So this is the outline of, of my current open file. So in, in this case, for this file, this is the list of all the functions that are um, defined here. So for example, I could just more easily find the get memory base address, see the implementation of that function. All right. So these are just standard getter methods. So the get memory base address just, just returns the member variable. So notice since I don't have uh, a parameter by that name, uh, so there's no ambiguity. So in this case, this refers to the member variable called memory base address. So whatever the variable for that base address is set to, it'll return that, which should be 300 um, if we, after we initialize it uh, by calling this method, right? So we got the memory base address, get the memory bounds address here, and the get memory size, right? So what I'm getting at that is, is by just adding, oops, by adding those three lines of code, um, uh, um, I expect now that if I initialize base and bounce 999, we should be able to pass all these now, right? So let's see what how we get here. I'll go ahead and do a clean build.
I'll go ahead and run my tests. Yes, so Before. So my first failing, uh, uh, so we're actually getting these all correct now. These, so so uh, our first failing one is down here where we uh, check that it's throwing um, um, an exception here. So. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, does anybody, unless somebody stop me for kind of a, a quick question or two here. I do encourage you if you're still having issues, you know, with your development environment, you know, make an appointment today. I mean, definitely email me, uh, but if we need to uh, make an appointment, we can do uh, kind of a, a Zoom or a face-to-face -face, uh, thing of, of some kind. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, the first assignment is due tomorrow. So you need to be working on it today um, and, and get those submitted. Um, I might try and um, do some code reviews tomorrow sometime. So if, if you do, if, uh, you know, you, you should try and make commits and push them as you're doing them, right? So if you have anything committed before tomorrow afternoon or sometime, I can give you some preliminary feedback maybe if I get to it. So, so keep that in mind, but you might want to do that. Um, all right, any last questions? All right, let, let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, I'll go ahead and stop this and get this video posted. Uh, just, just email me uh, if you need to contact me about something. Uh, otherwise, that's it. I'll, I'll see you guys um, uh, next week.